four minutes to five or thereabouts. You are, you're with GB News. Now, let's tell you that 35 years ago today, Terry Waite, a name that will mean something to some of you, uh, less to others of, uh, others of you out there, Terry Waite was kidnapped in Beirut. For the next five years, the Archbishop of Canterbury's envoy was chained to a radiator in a windowless cell and subjected, for instance, to mock execu executions uh, and other forms of torture too. His survival... I think we can agree, and as we're about to discuss, a study really in self-control and stoicism of the highest order. Uh, Will Geddes, the security expert, is here alongside me. We were just talking during the commercial break, weren't we, about what an extraordinary man he is. Um, he had an active life of the mind. Part of that was he was a prayerful man, so he was able to occupy himself. But I, I remember reading interviews with him and where he would do things like, for instance, and he would keep fit in his cell, but he would also take off his his um, day clothes, fold them up very carefully, put them under his mattress so that when he got up the next morning, his clothes would be pressed. Mm. These little routines stopped him going do lally. Yeah, absolutely essential. And I mean, and to be honest, Terry Waite almost wrote the book on hostage survival to a certain extent because he'd fulfilled one role as a hostage negotiator and a very successful one of that. I mean, he'd had people released out of Libya, out of Iran, uh, and the Lebanon was obviously where he came unstuck, and we'll probably go into that. But he was a negotiator, but then he was also a hostage. And of that four and a half odd, almost five years of captivity when he was held by the jihad organization, he was in solitary confinement. And that would be a challenge for anybody. So those processes of having small routines um, to follow each day, particularly in a windowless cell, is going to keep to a degree, a, a level of sanity. Did he bring it upon himself, to some degree, the capture, I mean? Well, it's a kind of a convergence of a number of different factors. Um, fundamentally, he was involved in the uh, negotiations of hostages out of Iran in 1985, which then constituted uh, or brought about the Iran Gate scandal. And for those that may not recall that, that was the US trading weapons with the Khomeini in Iran for the release of hostages. Now, he was assisting with that, but then was seen with Lieutenant Colonel Ollie North, who was the, the centre point of that whole Iran Gate scandal, and then subsequently seen on a helicopter travelling from Cyprus, and that was a US military helicopter. And his captors would have known all this. To Lebanon, would yes, and they, they would have seen that. And even though the media wasn't as sort of prolific as it is right now, and, and as far as... Prolific's one way of putting it. Well, well it's yeah. one way of putting it, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it was a case of fundamentally people seeing him featuring in a, in a big scandal, uh, certainly when it broke in 1986. So when he went to the Lebanon to assist in, obviously, the release of a number of notable hostages, um, he was already pretty much a public face and associated to it. You protect people. You advise people on how to stay safe. D did they get it wrong? What, what, I mean, apart from saying, you can't go, Terry, it's far too unsafe, what would have kept him out of harm's way back in 87? Well, it's a difficult one, because when you're involved in some hostage negotiations, um, the, the most important message you want to communicate to the kidnappers is, we're not interested in apprehending you. We're only interested in the welfare and the safe recovery of the hostage. So for Terry Waite, because he was connected and, and compromised as being part of Iran Gate and uh, such a monumental event, that created a distrust in the kidnappers. And it's very important. One of the things that I talk to negotiators about and something that negotiators will train is in being as honest as possible and ensuring that they don't lie. And if, if you're not honest and it seems to be some kind of deceit, then it can undermine the entire credibility of the negotiations going on. Building trust with desperate people. It feels like a story of our times, doesn't it? Indeed. In politics, not least. We'll get us. Thanks very much indeed for coming and really